Hey everybody, it's Bob Crossan, Senior Managing Editor for Water and Waste Digest. Today I'm here with Trisha Anklin. She is Director, Energy and Utilities for West Monroe. We're going to talk about the current drought in the West, water scarcity, how we got here, how it's reshaping the way that we're thinking about water resources, and what water-rich utilities in the East can learn about it. Thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate you taking the time to, to talk about this subject. Of course. Thanks for having me. I think we're at a really interesting and pivotal time here in the industry, so I'm excited to be talking with you today. Yeah, I mean, this, this drought is really carrying a lot of headlines right now. Um, mm -hmm. Could you talk about kind of the current status of things? And I, I know that California is, is kind of the, where most people are focused, but it's not just California. It's like the whole West. Yeah, absolutely. And we, we hear so much about California, of course, huge urban center of um, the United States, but it really is almost the entire West at this point that's in a drought, whether that's a severe drought or an extreme drought, um, I think really having a huge impact on, on agriculture, on customers, um, with both the size and just the severity of the drought that we're seeing right now. Yeah. Um, so in addition to changes in, in climate, what are some of the factors that are contributing to this, to what the water scarcity issue? Obviously the drought creates this problem from the get-go, but um, are there other factors that are contributing to water scarcity in California and like that whole Colorado River Basin area? Yeah, so I mean, of course at the fundamental piece of it, it's waterfall, it's snowpack. And so we've seen that from a climate standpoint, but um, a lot more of what we're seeing, too, is urbanization. I mean, we've seen in the last decades how many people have moved into cities and urban centers and how that puts more stress on our water supply, whereas historically we were a little bit more spread out. Now we are just seeing so much water demand in urban centers. Um, so that's had, uh, I think, a really significant impact. But then in addition to that, we have in the United States pretty archaic water rights laws and have some use it or lose it policies. And we just don't really have an efficient way to manage our water resources and fairly manage our water resources, especially in years like this and cycles like this when we are experiencing pretty extreme droughts. Yeah. Well, and what's interesting, too, about the, a lot of this, like I said, the, the Colorado River Basin is like basically servicing the whole West. So like you have all of these communities all tr vying for one thing. It's like six lanes of traffic trying to get to the one lane of traffic to get off the ramp. Right. And just the reality of that situation is that if the closer you are to the source and the initial supply, really the better position you are as much as we have these water rights laws. Um, there is an element too of the the closer you are, the better off you are. Yeah, the one of the things too that I'm interested in, in hearing your 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 feedback on is the uh, obviously wildfires become a big problem when there's drought like this too. So like you need water resources not just for the drinking water for people or for wastewater flow, but you also need it to stop the fires. Like so, there's even more demand than just the hu human beings there. It seems like. Right, and that is actually a really challenging and really scary thing to mitigate because when we have fires, one of the first things that happens is that we lose our power supply. And so we're relying on our water utilities to have backup generation capabilities and the ability to not just maintain water service, but also for fire protection, we need a pretty significant amount of water pressure. And so that's a whole nother thing that has to be managed and really managed at a regional level, knowing how expansive some of these wildfires um, can be. Yeah. So how is this crisis for, for this current drought, like the, what we're seeing this year, which is considered like seems historic so far, um, how is that changing the way that utilities are looking at their water resources, rate structures, infrastructure? I'm sure that there's like across the board, this is like, how do we address this from all these different angles? Because it's not just one or the other. Yeah, um, absolutely agreed. And I think that one thing, and most immediately, and this happened too in the last drought cycle we saw out west, is that utilities are looking to diversify their water supply. So um, whether that means increasing the supply or looking to new sources of supply, utilities are building bigger reservoirs. They are tapping their wells and going drilling, boring even deeper. They are looking at separate wholesale providers to really make sure that they can meet the water demands of their service area. So I think we're continuing to see that, like utilities are building more pipelines, they're investing, and this is really costly, especially when everybody wants um, more water, more sources of supply. Um, and then how you pay for it. So we are seeing right now just a lot of conversations about rate equity. Um, the rate equity that we have in the utilities industry right now, especially on the water side, 
um, is a little bit backwards. We have residential customers who kind of per amount of water per gallon used are paying the highest rates and have really historically been subsidizing some of our commercial and industrial and agricultural users. And I think with this drought and especially looking at in a drought where the majority of our water goes um, is really forcing a very overdue conversation about how we are paying for water, paying for it in a way that's fair, and making sure that we are focusing on just affordability, how we're protecting our most vulnerable communities, low-income citizens, communities of color, indigenous communities, um, to make sure that they have that same um, fair access to clean water. Yeah. Um, so, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, and then uh, infrastructure wise, I've, like uh, you talked about like reservoirs and like, you know, deepening your, 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 your resources and trying to find new and alternative ways to get resources. Uh, infrastructure could be a part of that solution there. Could you talk a little bit about what, uh, what is out there in that regard? Yeah, so a couple of different things. I think it is major the majority of utilities are looking to diversify their supply. Um, if they've historically all been looking at groundwater, they might be looking to wholesale providers in the region who can pump in water. So really trying to have a couple of different sources so that you're protected against um, if one of those sources of supply goes down because of the drought, if it becomes contaminated, I think is even a longer term kind of security uh, issue. But then we're also seeing utilities um, really focus more on even stormwater management. Um, so I'm uh, from the Chicago area, and there's actually a pretty interesting program called TARP in Chicago, where they have built massive um, reservoirs, hundreds of miles of piping um, to collect some of that excess rainfall. Um, in the Midwest and East Coast, we have larger issues with um, sanitary sewer overflows during storms. And then not only that, but then we aren't always capturing and using that water. And I think that's something that we could be doing a lot more of in the West, um, not necessarily for sanitary overflow, but to make sure that when we get rain and we finally have this um, water access that we are capturing it, that we can store it and that we can then treat it um, to use as a potable water source. Yeah, TARP is a, an incredible program. And um, I visited the, the Thornton Reservoir is enormous absolutely gigantic yeah. and then uh, i believe there's uh, a stormwater diversion tunnel in Ar albany park as well which is also just a gigantic tunnel um we've uh St stormwater solutions our sister magazine has a couple articles on that so we'll make sure to link those in our description so that people can learn a little bit more about those but um back back to the point of kind of how people are rethinking about this what about it from like the, the public side of things like how customers feel about this the water customers what are how are they looking at things what impacts are are they feeling obviously the number one thing is like oh you just can't mow your, you can't wa water your lawn as much really right like that's the the top one but what are some things that they're learning through this process and how is it reshaping the way the public looks at water resources yeah and i think this is actually one of the really interesting and also a little bit sad areas of the drought that i think a lot of customers especially the residential single family homes um, sometimes view their conservation efforts as futile. When you look at how much of our water goes to agricultural use, industrial use, um, there's this narrative that what I do doesn't matter. And that's something that I really push back against. I think at this point, especially with how extreme this drought has gotten, that everything we do matters. And so I think that that's a really important conversation for utilities to be having with their customer base. And by far, I mean, it's outdoor irrigation use. And so the less that you can be watering your grass, the better. But then also things like, um, low flow appliances, taking shorter showers, um, they uh, aren't going to save us altogether, but it makes a difference. And that's something that we should um, value and we should really encourage customers to conserve. Um, I also think it's interesting too, to look at how cities and um, utilities can take leadership here. Um, like for example, the city of Las Vegas recently started banning ornamental grass um, so that we're not putting in grass that doesn't get used. So in like thoroughfares and medians and commercial office parks, um, making sure that where we have grass is actually um, used and useful by people um, so that we aren't just wasting water to keep that alive. So yeah. I think I was going to say the dr drought tolerant plants in general are a big part. I know like Arizona is very, very good about this, of using a lot of drought tolerant plants and things to beautify neighborhoods without needing a tremendous amount of water to, con to consume. Yeah. And I think too, so as part of that, one interesting piece of this conversation is also what happens if you're not a homeowner? Um, that so much of um, like your water utility is dependent on the appliances you have, the landscaping you have. And so we are starting to see that some utilities are 
um, working more closely with tenants or with homeowners to make sure that we're talking to both parts of the customer here um, to make sure that we have landlords who are maintaining their toilets and not having toilet leaks and doing just some of those things that um, a tenant pays the bill for, even though they might not be responsible for actually doing the maintenance on whether that's the landscaping, the plumbing, any of the fixture, fixtures uh, within the home. Yeah. Well, we talked a little bit about how stormwater can play a role here about trying to capture some of that. What are, are there some programs that are happening in California and the West that are kind of bringing that more to the fore? Yeah, we are seeing some changes in how utilities bill for stormwater. Stormwater um, rates are increasing, and I think there are more and more um, incentives that if people are installing um, kind of stormwater friendly um, landscaping infrastructure that they are getting credits, whether that be on their bill directly or any kind of rebates from their utility. So I think that is certainly a move in the right direction because really everything we do to help capture that stormwater, make sure that's kind of going back into our groundwater supply rather than being diverted out um, is helpful, especially to the region right now as we're facing such an extreme drought. Yeah. So looking at like obviously the west we've been talking about for the most part but like when you look to the east of the rockies and like uh, you mentioned like chicago is a rather water rich area it's right next to lake michigan all the great lakes communities tend to have really easy quick access to water but we also know that places like joliet are running out of groundwater and need to tap into that lake as well so what are some things that like these eastern communities that currently are water rich or ha don't have as big a problem with water scarcity? What can they learn about things happening in the West that would actually apply to them? Yeah, and I think in the Midwest and East Coast, some utilities have really been trained that conservation doesn't matter. They have such rich areas of supply, whether that be groundwater or any of the surface water in the area, that they historically really haven't had to conserve. And sometimes it's not even financially viable to conserve. It might cost more to fix the leak than the water costs itself. Um, fortunately, I think that's changing though. I think people are starting to recognize that financially the costs of water are going up so the payoff is there, but then also as just stewards of the environment that we have a responsibility to conserve this resource knowing that it's not infinite. So I think across the country, we are starting to see just a heightened awareness and it'll be interesting to see as some of these utilities do become water stressed or have water scarcity, um, how we start building and enforcing water rights laws um, really more broadly. Um, I think it'll be really interesting to see how that plays out just both financially and legally to see how we share this resource because I think people are starting to push back on the concept of just because you live by it means it's it's yours to use and treat as you want. And we are moving more towards an area where everyone needs to be responsible and share the supply we have. Because with water especially, I mean, we look at the housing um, crisis that we're facing right now and how housing costs have increased. I do think water is even going to start factoring into that with homeowners wanting to know what their source of supply is, how sustainable it is as they start to make um, those investments. And so I think we already are seeing that on the West Coast, but I think we'll see more and more of that in the Midwest and the East um, as, again, those water rates increase and we see just more stress on our water supply overall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it that, that just really drives home the, the whole um, one water movement to me too of like, we've talked about like, oh, stormwater can play a role, how reservoirs play a role. And like, all this stuff is all connected, right? Like if you're talking about the Great Lakes, like Chicago's not the only thing pulling down from the Great Lakes, right? Like that's all one water being used by so many people. So there is a stewardship that needs to happen across all those communities. So that, that's a good point that you make there. Yeah, certainly. And I think it's not just how we use it and what we're using, but it's also how we treat it, the discharge we're putting into the water. Um, we actually, as a country, are pretty lenient on our water quality standards and that at a federal level, there's pretty minimal regulation. And so I think that's also part of the conversation as we look to these um, really being critical supplies for us, making sure that we're doing everything we can to um, protect the integrity of the water that we have and to make sure that we have enough of it and are using it in a responsible way so that we are prepared for when we have droughts and droughts that happen across the country. Yeah. So looking forward, where, where do you kind of see things headed for the industry as, the, as we try to push this period of extreme drought? Um, what, what's going to what do you think is going to happen next for the West? Are there policy changes on the horizon? Like what's what's kind of like what are they thinking about over there? 
Yeah, so I certainly think that, again, given the scarcity, that is inevitably going to push water rates up. And we've seen in the last decade how quickly rates have risen, and that's going to get worse, um, compounded by we need to make massive infrastructure investments. Plus, now there's less supply. Wholesale providers are charging more. Groundwater providers are charging more. So I think that's like the number one thing that we're going to see is that the cost is going to mirror the challenge of getting everybody water that they need today. And then that brings up the concept of just affordability, rate equity, and what we're doing to make sure that water is still an affordable resource, especially to our vulnerable communities. Um, I think those will be a couple of the biggest things. And then compounded on that, when people are paying really a premium for their water, I think that we are going to see an increase in customer attention and just demands for higher standards. Um, we have a lead crisis in this country, but we also have all these emerging contaminants that we know about. But haven't done a lot to set federal drinking water standards. So I think that as people pay more, we'll be paying more attention. And I really hope to see that we are setting um, higher standards and really holding our water utilities accountable and helping them um, make sure that we're delivering um, the best possible and highest quality water that we can across our population. Well, thank you so much, Trisha. I really appreciate you taking the time today. We've le learned a tremendous amount. Um, uh, if, we're, if you are watching this and you want to learn a little bit more, we'll have a link to West Monroe in our in our description below, along, as, along with the links about TARP and the stormwater tunnels and stuff in Chicago, because those are very, very interesting projects. And uh, if you want to also learn a little bit more about what's going on in the West, we do have a Western Water Crisis Hub page where we're curating some news articles throughout the week on what's go what's happening out west and whatnot so check that out as well we'll have that in the description too so trisha thank you once again for for being with us we really appreciate you taking the time and um hopefully it the drought doesn't last for eternity <laughs> <laughs> agreed i hope we uh, get some rain out here out west and we really need it um thanks so much bob for having me it was really great to talk with you today